Hey guys, it's Edward. Today, I'll be talking about a systematic way of approaching the system design interview. In my last video, we talked about what the system design interview is. I talked about what an ideal candidate looks like and the criteria by which we should judge him. A good candidate is someone who can actually create a system with logical, clear, and thoughtful consideration. It is not someone who can spit out a bunch of random tech stacks off the top of his head. What we're going to do today is create a process to systematically approach the system design interview using this policy. We will explain why this works, and at the end, I'll recommend some resources to use and how to use them to improve. This template works at every company, at every level, and for most problems. I've coached clients to use this all the way up to the staff engineering level. So with that, let's begin. Now, much in the same vein as my section on how to get good at the algorithm section, the same can be applied for the system design. Nothing really changes here. We want a systematic approach that can consistently get us answers and a way to reliably improve our thinking and approach over time with practice. But with the shared volume of information out there on system design and no way to really tie things together, it becomes insanely difficult to do this well. I don't believe many people can master more than one or two things at a time. This is why I do not think people should pursue system design study while mastering data structures and algorithm problems. I would heavily recommend you finish data structures and algorithms before starting this part. In fact, the general algorithm for solving system design problems is not unlike actually solving a leak code style question itself and by proxy is not unlike the engineering process. So let's actually declare our steps. The first is to design the basic high level end to end solution. After that is to decide our current pain points or unknowns after making this decision. We address the inefficiencies or problems that occur as we add more constraints or build out the system. If we can solve the issue, what are the general requirements and parameters of the solution? And finally, if we have some prerequisite that prevents us from progressing forward, we will solve these prerequisites by returning back to step two. This step by step seems actually very simple. After all, it's just iterating over a product as we encounter more and more errors, because as you scale up, there are certain factors that will eventually falter and fail inevitably. This might be multiple writes to a database. It might be the server load that you need to replicate across regions. As your audience scales, it necessitates these new solutions. Even at Facebook and Google scale, they face a lot of problems. They are having to deal with the fallibilities of processors themselves to fail at instruction execution, a problem that literally no other company is handling. And for the most part, we programmers do not assume this problem exists. This might seem really out of place, but the point here is that there will always be problems that need to be handled, no matter how scaled up you are or how many times you've iterated and gone through your system. As you keep progressing forward in time, there will be new problems to address and new ways to fix it. If you think your system is perfect, you're most likely wrong. But wait, you might say, I'd be revising my answer multiple, multiple times in this case. There isn't enough time to keep iterating and I can't possibly know everything. That just means that you are not good enough at making good and fast decisions. In these conversations, the higher skilled you are, the more implicit assumptions are made about statements, implementations, and so on. Yet at any point, these statements can be justified and a qualified candidate can deep dive into the discussion. In fact, the more competent an engineer, the more efficient he is at this process of balancing progress in the design and delivering just enough information needed to justify it. This means a very competent engineer knows what discussions to skip, what discussions to dive into, and what pain points to actually address. But he can go back into any of these points at any time that were skipped and omitted and dive into them. For instance, if I talk about returning data to the user that requires a complex set of dependent queries, I can get away with mentioning offhand that the database is MySQL because there's a very good chance that simply doing relational joins is going to give me a better performance and move on. I don't need to go through the whole exercise of different forms of databases and arrive at the conclusion that MySQL work fine. 
I already know the shortcomings of putting elements into a comma separated file using as NoSQL and a bunch of other common databases that might be proposed to solve this particular problem. And if the interviewer asked me to perform that exercise of trade-offs, I could do that in my sleep. But such assumptions and knowing what to skip and what decisions to actually deep dive into only come with experience. After years of making wrong decisions and with real world experience on the job, you will know what will help you make the right decisions and what the results are going down the wrong paths. But this doesn't mean that you cannot do this in the system design. In fact, with enough practice, even a novice can do this at a staff level. Enough chit chat. Let's actually dive into each one of these steps and how these relate into actually creating a solution and how you can use them. So the first step, design the basic high level end to end. This is where you actually craft your MVP, your minimum viable product. This is what will cover your P90 case or so, because no system is actually created perfectly or instantly right off the bat, but you do need to start somewhere. This is not unlike the code or engineering process itself. You start off with a very naive solution with off the shelf components that will service a small set of users. You get your product up and running and then address the concerns that you run into. Now, step two, what is our current pain point or unknown after making this decision? Address the inefficiencies or problems that occur as we add more constraints or build out the system. Because every system and design has their limitations and trade-offs, we are forced to address them. And this is an exercise that we will repeat over and over again, not just across problems, but even within the same problem. As we scale up in users, resources, or some other activity like external vendors, our system will eventually start failing on us or having issues in one or more areas. At this point, we will update those areas. For instance, if I need to scale up my database, I might want to consider sharding the data. If I am expanding geographically, I may want to consider replication. If I want to handle queries in a better way, I might want to change from a standard MySQL database to a NoSQL database. But what drives these changes are the consideration of trade-offs and how the system is being used. Let me repeat that because a lot of people think otherwise. What drives these changes are a consideration of trade-offs and how the system is being used. What most people believe is that the system should just solve today's problems. What the reality is, is that the system should actually grow and evolve to not just solve today's problems, but how it will be used in the future and what problems it will face tomorrow and the day after. It should be robust enough that anyone can make a change and quickly address any future anticipated problems that they might run into without breaking the entire thing. Now, step three, if we cannot solve the issue, what are the requirements or parameters of the solution? We might know what we'd ideally like to do. The problem is that our solution needs to be relevant to the matter at hand, and we would like to be able to be as intelligent as possible about it. If we're able to use one solution, along what dimension should we use it? For instance, we may want to cache some portion of the returned result. The question then becomes where this cache should live, how long the cache data should live, and what our caching policy should begin with. After all, these factors and dimensions should be relevant to the end user's behavior and how the system will be treated and used. A big mistake people make here is that they think the system should be robust enough to just handle the initial problem and only the initial problem. What you really need to ask yourself is how the user is going to use your system and what reasonable behaviors they may have. For instance, it does not make sense to have a caching policy where the time to live is two weeks if we are designing an instant messaging app or so. Because in this case, people don't really care about messages that were more than three days ago. But that consideration might change if we are designing a newsfeed website like Reuters, where people will actually look up recent news within the past month. Now, step four, if we have some prerequisites that prevent us from solving the problem, solve these prerequisites first. Return back to step two for every single prerequisite that might be blocking us. Of course, not every optimization is going to work right out of the gate. You might have some prior questions or blocking concerns that prevent you from implementing the solution that you want. In that case, go back and repeat the exercise for that blocking factor. It's more or less an extension of trying to unstuck yourself out of a problem or a situation when doing your data structures or algorithm problem. 
Work backwards and ask yourself what you need to know and what is preventing you from knowing it until you can arrive at a simple matter of fact or a very easy to make straightforward decision. Now that you know the step by step, I can now explain where the real judgment of the system interview is. The real judgment, like I said above, is in how you make these decisions, the branch points, the negotiations. If I ask you why a component is in place, you should be able to provide a logical answer based on factors and considerations, whether they are given to you or one that you figure out yourself reasonably. The only real difference between a top tier engineer and a L4 engineer at this stage is how quickly they can think through all these questions by prioritizing which decisions actually need to be made and are having some idea of the answer beforehand. This usually happens because they are very well experienced with these components or whatever they're talking about. This comes with experience, but as a general principle for people who are unexperienced, the best decisions are almost always the ones that will give you the most options later on. This is why I believe that this approach is absolutely the best in terms of completeness, especially when starting out. It forces you to really consider what your problem areas are. It forces you to think about how these components actually works. It forces you to justify them from multiple angles to a skeptical interviewer. And finally, it is systematic and logical. The benefit is that you, if you repeat this process over and over again on multiple systems and multiple problems, common solutions begin to appear and you will eventually get a knack for understanding what steps you can skip because you've already done this exercise and justification before. Again, this is not unlike the data structures and algorithms portions. So then what are the best resources to use to get started? The best way to actually improve at the system design interview is iteratively. Look at the solutions provided by a good source of knowledge like grokking the system design and try to engineer the thought process behind developing the system. Why did they pick the components that they did? What was the intention of each step? What was the pain point that they intended to deal with? For any area that you don't quite understand like sharding or synchronization, you should read the corresponding Designing Data Intensive Applications chapter, or DDIA. I personally find it meaningless to read this very dense 500 page book in one sitting, especially without applying it. And with my clients, I find that they experience the exact same thing. What I find most effective is to really consume maybe 10 or 15 pages at a time and really try to practice the ideas in those pages. For instance, if I do not understand why a load balancer would be placed at position A instead of position B, then I'll go back and reread the chapter on it and really try to apply what I've read to the solution that I just saw. It's not so important that I agree or disagree with the answer. It's important that I understand or at least come up with a reason to why the solution puts a load balancer to where it is and what characteristics of the load balancer actually lend itself to that solution. You need to actually repeat this process over and over again until you've understood a good majority of DDIA and can hold a meaningful conversation. If I wake you up in the middle of the night and ask you how asynchronous replication and synchronization works for various configurations of leader, leader list, and multi-leader databases, you should actually be able to tell me this and do it flawlessly. Otherwise, you need to practice harder and be patient. This alone can take you easily three to six months, especially if you're starting from scratch. Don't rush this process. Just give it time and deliver quality practice and eventually the results will come. Now in closing, the system design is not hard. It's not unlike actually solving a leak code problem where every step you take is meant to address the inefficiencies in a solution where people mess up is in trying to throw some predetermined tech stack at a problem and thinking it magically solves everything. Those people have never tasted a catastrophic architectural failure from any shitty decisions and don't understand the gravity of their decisions. These are the last people you should ever ask to help you on your system. And yes, there's an infinite number of things to consider. The databases, the software architecture, the load balancing, sharding, etc. But if you understand them at a high enough level and can describe the arrangement or characteristics of the problem, you actually don't even need to read up on the latest and greatest tech stacks. Tech comes and goes, and what people really want is to hire the right guy who can analyze and understand the right technology to use. A company that does not do that is a company that I would bet against with every single dollar I have. Now that you have a good understanding of the basics of approaching the system design interview, you can actually begin properly practicing. In the next video, I will give you a practical example. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Also, 
feel free to follow me on my socials where you can vote for what topic I cover next. And if you want to try and secure the next job offer, you can book me for interview coaching at eChantech.com. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'll see you all in the next one.